when we lit up our cities, we banished the night. Living in perpetual twilight makes us feel more safe, secure and modern than letting in the dark. The four billion people living in and around cities cannot escape the light. Many of them live their lives aware only of what the lights illuminate and not what they hide. At the centre of New Zealand's South Island, on the shores of Lake Tekapo, Mount John Observatory relies on darkness for delicate astronomical research. Mount John was selected as um, the, the best place in New Zealand, all things considered, for setting up a major research observatory. Uh, similarly, uh, Black Birch Range in Marlborough was um, very good uh, when, when conditions were good there, but it suffered from severe gales uh, when the wind was coming through at Cook Strait. And it was also considerably higher than Mount John, so it had winter access problems. So all things considered, Mount John was, was the best site. The region is very good, gets the best weather in New Zealand for astronomy because it is surrounded by mountains. We have the Southern Alp on the west side of us and we have the Two Thumb Range running down most of the east side of the Mackenzie Basin. And those mountain ranges keep uh, most of the low cloud out. 50% uh, of our nights are usable. That is not necessarily completely clear but, but they are usable for astronomy. About 20% of our nights are what we call photometric. That is they're completely clear. Uh, no cloud at all. So that's as good as you're going to get um, anywhere in New Zealand. Mount John was a closed gate facility for much of its history. Public access was prohibited until 2004, when local businessmen helped finance an advanced new telescope for the observatory. It was 2004 when Earth and Sky began. Um, Hede Ozawa came to me one night and said that Nagoya University were trying very hard to establish a leading edge telescope here, a microlensing telescope, and uh, they desperately needed support from the universities in New Zealand, etc. But they weren't very financial at the time, so Hede and I agreed we would um, be the seeding of the Nagoya through the University of Canterbury. Earth and Sky's funding laid the foundation for the MOA telescope to be installed at Mount John. The gesture also paved the way for Earth and Sky to unlock this once gated facility for themselves and for the public. That was our early beginnings on Mount John, really to um, support Nagoya University and in the process we negotiated to get the key to the gate. It was a locked facility up until that time. The astronomers slept in the daytime and worked at night and uh, so the, the plus for us was the key to the gate and to open up Mount John for outreach for the University of Canterbury and for people to freely visit during the daytime and come up and watch the stars at night. It, it was very, very difficult to survive in those first few, few years. Two or three people a day would come up here. In my case, I just represented the average human that, uh, that's in big numbers out there, That and whether you're Amazon or South Africa or New Guinea or whatever part of the world you come from, I feel every human has an affiliation with the stars. So how could we go wrong on a location like this? Well, we got very hungry, we nearly starved, but now it's, it's, it's finding its way. None of this would have mattered were it not for strict lighting controls put in place over 30 years earlier. 
it's all very fine to have a dream of keeping a sky clear of light pollution. But to get lighting ordinances in place in this modern world is next to impossible now. But someone had already done that in 1981. That was the, that's what made this all possible. These lighting ordinances protect the skies over Tekapo from light pollution, preserving the darkness for astronomers and visitors alike. The observatory is very sensitive to light in the sky. Any light that's up in the sky uh, gets into the telescopes and um, it means that we don't see such faint background stars. Also, it causes pollution in what we call spectra, that is, we, we analyse the light from stars and so we can see what chemical elements are in stars and we can obtain all sorts of other information about stars from, from the spectrum of a star. So if you have scattered artificial light in the sky, then that uh, upsets that sort of work. So we rely on having a, a really dark sky. And the Mackenzie District Council have been very cooperative over many years in ensuring that this is um, the dark sky is maintained. The district plan requires that outside lights be directed down, um, that they be filtered so there's not uh, an excess of, of blue and ultraviolet light in the light. Um, the Mackenzie District Council itself has installed low pressure sodium street lights. Light pollution affects all of us whether we realise it or not. To try and define um, what light pollution is, um, you, you essentially just need to step outside in a, in a city and it's there, it's all around you. It is light that is um, being spilled into our environment. Well-lit areas are important for, our, for human use. It provides safety. But the way the, that lighting has been applied traditionally over the last hundred years or so hasn't been as well done or as efficient as it could be. Some of the lighting actually reduces the, your ability to see well at night. If you can see a light, it is not helping you see as well as you should be able to see. So even in the daytime, we go to great lengths to keep the sun out of our field of vision. We do not like looking directly at the sun. So the same effect happens at night. If you've got a bright light in your field of view, which most New Zealand street lights are directly in your field of view when you're driving, they, uh, your, your eye reacts to that bright source of light and shuts down the iris, which reduces your ability to see peripheral vision. So any object, maybe a pedestrian on the footpath or something, is harder to see because of that direct light that's coming into your eyes. So light pollution is light that is being distributed beyond the area that should be lit, directly into your eyes or um, up into the environment, um, brightening the total environment rather than the area that you want to see. To see a night sky free of light pollution, tourists from around the world travel with Earth and Sky to Mount John at night. We come from Mexico City, so long away from him. <laughs> uh, Mexico City is a big, a huge city, so we don't have like many opportunities to see the stars clearly. First, because it is very polluted, we have a lot of pollution there. And secondly, because as you can imagine, a big city, you have a lot of lights, a lot of cars. I, I, I guess we are going to see a more, more brighter stars here. <laughs> that is the darkest place. But about this place, uh, we have heard that it's like the, the best observatory we can, <laughs> we can be at. We can, so we can see many stars here. And, and one of the telescopes that we, we have read about the telescope that is one of the best in the world. So that's what we know about here.
perspective, um, access to the night sky is a human right. Um, being able to see a beautiful starlit sky is one of the, the most fundamental pleasures you can have as a human being. And my view is that that's being taken away from us um, over many, many years, especially if you live in a city. Um, your view of the night sky has effectively been stolen by a very poor lighting design and by this light pollution. So I really do agree um, with the Dark Sky Association's principles of you know, returning the night sky so that everybody, no matter where they live, has a chance of seeing some of these stunning things up there. Hedai very critically said to me one night, way back in late 2004, that we New Zealanders take our stars for granted. And if Japan had a dark sky like this, they would create a park to protect it. These humble beginnings led to recognition by the International Dark Sky Association in 2012. The Araki um, Mackenzie International Dark Sky Reserve was recognised by the International Dark Sky Association after we put in a submission uh, setting out the lighting ordinances, setting out the present lighting that we have in the region and the requirements that the lighting standards that we have will be will be maintained so that we have the largest international dark sky reserve in the world. important place here, halfway between Christchurch and Queenstown. Um, probably about 1.4 million visitors pass through this area each year. But it's always been a transit place. There's no, uh, it's never been a place to come and stay. The Starlight Reserve is, is Tekapo's true identity. I heard someone mention the other day, a sanctuary for the stars. And that's the words that will ring out. transition from day to night acts as a trigger which resets important biological rhythms in our bodies. The light that we um, put into the night environment um, has the potential to, to change that environment. We have adapted to a daytime bright period and a nighttime dark period. The trigger that um, resets our circadian rhythm to a 24-hour cycle or the day-night cycle is daylight. So in the morning light resets or recalibrates our circadian rhythm. If we, through artificial lighting, modify the night environment so that it mimics the daytime lighting systems, we inhibit the production of melatonin at night, which has some quite wide-ranging impacts on human health. Melatonin has properties which inhibit the development of um, malignant cells. And so by suppressing melatonin production, we run the risk of allowing cancers to develop. This has um, been picked up by the World Health Organization and others through um, women in particular initially uh, working night shifts under, under bright white light. Um, developing breast cancer. The same um, processes are involved in prostate cancer and bowel cancer, so you know it's it's right across the the gender range. By changing that 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 normal di um, light and dark cycle, uh, we we just un unsettled the balance. The night sky belongs to all of us. Its protection is a shared responsibility. I think uh, any average human would probably do the same. Just thinking about, you know, my younger days, like most of us in New Zealand, we've laid out under the stars, marvelled at them and all that, and they itch a certain corner in your being. So, so it wasn't a hard, um, 
a decision just as a layman who struggled to name the planet sort of thing to say, gee, this is, this is an incredible opportunity, not only for ourselves, for University of Canterbury and Mount John, but for Tekapo and let's face it, the, the world's going the wrong way. This is a very special occasion, just the peace, the quiet, the silence. A very famous European composer accused me of playing with people's souls. He was so affected by uh, lying in the tussock here. You don't have to come and look through a telescope. His biggest wish was to lie in the tussock and bond with the stars. He'd never done that anywhere else in the world. He did it here and he's still getting over it. Having our skies illuminated not only subjects us to health risks, but separates us from understanding our place in the universe. I think it's important for us to be able to see the stars because humanity developed under the stars. We navigated by the stars both on land and on sea. Uh, but also the sky is, is very pretty. It's, it's uh, a, a dark night sky is a beautiful thing to behold. It's, uh, uh, and it's something that most people, certainly many people in suburban situations have completely lost contact with. I remember sitting around a campfire in the middle um, of the Welsh countryside once uh, with a group of friends. And when we looked up at the stars and started talking, um, you talk about the distances of the stars, how the light that you see left those stars, in some cases hundreds or thousands or millions of years ago, in some galaxies cases, and you, you, you really get a, a, an idea of the scale of the universe. And I think that is terribly important. Uh, when you look up at the size of the cosmos, and you realize that we're on such a small, tiny little part of it, um, I think it inspires you to kind of connect with the world and hopefully make the world a better place. Being able to see the night sky, uh, for me uh, at least, is it helps me put into perspective you know, what a human existence is on this planet. We're not day-to-day -day people. We are part of a much, much wider experience, uh, existence. interact with the universe constantly. If you can step outside at night and just see the vastness of the sky and, and start to understand where we are. We're on a planet that's going around the sun, the sun's going around the galaxy, the galaxy's travelling through space. You know, we're, it's a fantastic place out there, you know, we should be enjoying it.